now to start the last uh, session of the day and this is uh, this is about let me say the role of machine learning in uh, in physics in quantum physics and uh, i think there is really a lot of excitement in the physics community uh, uh, about the you know the, the potentialities of, of machine learning in you know attacking difficult problems in uh, condensed matter physics and molecular physics and so on. So I think it would be it would be a very very interesting um, session. So Gabor, you may you may start. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So do you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Have you seen my mouse? Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. Okay. So uh, this uh, I, 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 my this is the first talk. In this uh, in this session, and also uh, I've chosen to use it as a as a way of, to introduce not just this but the following sessions on quantum chemistry and and uh, machine learning of physics and complex systems. My own uh, work, though, is in uh, is to do with force fields, so that's what this talk will be about. So machine learning, the quantum mechanics of materials and molecules. So uh, the, he, here's a picture of the multiple scales of materials modeling. So on the, it's a very busy slide, but on the very bottom, you have quantum chemistry. We can actually solve the Schrodinger equation. So what, what, what does that look like? Here's the electronic Schrodinger equation. Looks simple, it's an eigenvalue problem uh, in its time independent form, h psi equals e psi, but del squared plus v of r times psi is equal to e psi. But of course, uh, this psi is a very high dimensional object, right? It's the wave function of many, many electrons for a given set of nuclear positions. And the solutions of this PDE uh, would be all the eigenvectors, all the wave functions. Uh, and for a given set of nuclear positions, they are three dimensional functions unique uh, for each nuclear configuration. So of course, this is a very, very hard problem. And there are many, many approximations to the, uh, to the shared equation itself and to the way uh, it is solved, then they generally go under the name of uh, quantum mechanical calculations, quantum mechanical simulations, and so on. As you go uh, up higher, of course, uh, you are able to treat more and more atoms, more and more electrons and atoms, and or more and more time if you're doing a dynamical simulation, that's on the horizontal axis, but on the vertical axis, of course, you lose accuracy due to the simulation, due to the approximations uh, that you're doing. And at some point you cross over into the world of interatomic potentials. So what is that? Otherwise known as force fields. Is when we want to consider just the lowest eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation, so forget the eigenfunctions, all I care about is the eigenvalue and only the smallest one. And essentially that then becomes a function a scalar function of just the three end positions of the nuclei. But I, I don't have any electrons anymore once I pose the problem this way. So really just three end positions of atoms and that let's call that capital R and I have a single scalar function. And think of that as the potential energy of a bunch of atoms in space. So if you have just two of them with distance D between them it's going to look something like this, okay? And once you have, if you have a potential uh, function like that then you can apply Newton's law and do molecular dynamics. And that opens up an, the entire world of, well, 99% of the world of chemistry and the entire world of uh, material science. So that allows you to do uh, the, the study the structure and stability of materials and molecules and their transformations. And once you, because you don't have to deal with the Schrodinger equation anymore, you don't have to deal with the electrons anymore, the number of atoms you can treat or equivalently the time scales that you can access jumps by a big factor. So electrons on the left with varying approximations, no electrons on the right, and there's this big gap in accuracy and also speed. So the question is, how can we, uh, how can we break through this, uh, this hierarchy? So we would like something that is very, very fast but also as accurate as quantum chemistry, as long as the question that I'm asking isn't about the electrons, but only about the atoms. And what I'm going to show you is that previously, potentials, approximations like this to the lowest eigenvalue were not very good. And now using ideas from machine learning, um, we can make them 
much, much better. Just to convince you that this is actually a, a, a rather important problem, I looked up the uh, usage uh, for the UK and the US uh, supercomputers. The numbers are a little bit dated, but these things don't change very much. So again, green is electronic problems, red is once you've only look at, looking at the atomic problem of um, the, um, the lowest eigenvalue. And this is the UK national supercomputer, Hector from 2012. And all the green time is taken up by various codes that solve the Schrodinger equation. And the red slice is taken up by codes that, that, that do interatomic potentials or force fields. And you can see that a third of the time is taken up, or, or, it is across all science, is taken up by doing uh, solving the Schrodinger equation or approximating its lowest eigenvalue. And a slightly more recent example from the US, this is the Blue Waters machine. And here's the, the, the these are the different codes. And this is a log scale of the, of the CPU hours used. And here the red are the eigenvalue approximations and the green again are the electronic structure explicit solutions of the Schrodinger equation or some approximation thereof. And you can see that if you add up the first few bars on the left here, again, note the log scale, about a quarter of the machine is taken up by, by approximating the lowest eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation. So any, any, uh, anything we can do to help that, either making it faster or making it more accurate, is actually going to have a very big impact across all of science as measured by supercomputer usage. Just across, let's say, across computational science. So, uh, so what are these force fields uh, before machine learning uh, comes on the scene? So one, set, one kinds of force fields, one kind of approximation to the, to the Schrodinger eigenvalue um, has been used for gas phase molecules. And it's really targeting accuracy. I'm listing a few names here of people who I know who have been in, very active in the past. So the idea here is that you, do, you create a, a fit to data, you, solve the Schrodinger equation a number of times, and you fit that solution, the lowest eigenvalue solution, using a systematic polynomial basis. It really sounds quite simple. There are sort of mathematical trickery that you need to make it happen. But essentially, this lowest eigenvalue, E, is approximated by a function, a polynomial of the distance between every pair of atoms, a three-dimensional function, every triplet distances between every triplet of atoms, a, four pol a polynomial between every distances between every four atoms and so on. So there are six of distances like that. And you can see that there's going to be an exponential scaling in the number of parameters and even worse in the number of symmetric polynomials that are going to be used if you're going to go into down this route. But the accuracy you get is exquisite. So for small molecules, it's really better than experiment. But here's an example from uh, Francesco Pesani's uh, a recent work. So I'm showing you the predictions of the infrared and Raman spectra. So these are spectroscopic techniques as applied to bulk water. Topi's experiment uh, and no, Topi's calculation. Uh, well, yes, yeah, sorry, the, uh, the, uh, the noises confuse me. The Topi's experiment with very low noise and the bottom um, is uh, Francesco's calculation simulations, um, which are uh, really, really very, very accurate uh, for, these, for this very difficult system. Then a, a different kind of interatomic potential, different kind of force field are created for organic uh, molecules. And here the aim is rather than accuracy, the aim is transferability. So the idea is that you take small molecules like amino acids as shown here, and you create a set of um, terms which are all very simple, essentially a 1D separable expansion. Looks, looks a little bit similar to the gas phase solutions, but actually it's quite different. 1D potential for the, uh, for the bonded term between every pair of atoms, and then a single one dimensional angle term just to keep the correct angle between um, different molecules, different triplets of molecules, and so on. And all these uh, functions are lots of uh, parameters to fit. They're usually done by hand. And you can think of it as a Taylor expansion uh, in very specific 1D. A sum of 1D Taylor expansions. They are accurate for very small displacement. Typically, they don't allow reactions with some very few exceptions. And the ultimate idea is to fit them to experimental properties of, of, of molecules. And here's an example. Uh, it's not a very typical one, but it allows me to show that if you run high temperature molecular dynamics, the accuracy uh, is really not very good. 
uh, in the sense that you get the right trends, but you don't actually get the right uh, potential energies. You don't, your, your approximation of the eigenvalue is not very good, but people still use it because it is rather transferable once it's been fitted to experiments for, for the kinds of properties that people are interested in. And then uh, in the sort of the third corner are solid state materials where reactions, bond breaking is, is all the rage. And here you are interested in uh, formation of different crystal phases, solids, phase diagrams perhaps, and we use physics-based functional forms. It's very much not systematic. And the idea is very phenomenological. So simplest parametric models to capture some phenomena. Here's an example. The lowest eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation is simply approximated as a 1D function of a sum of pairwise terms. So this is a little bit of recursion here to get the, the many body aspect of, of, of the problem. But um, you will see that uh, when applied to some specific model, here's a model of silicon, um, really the errors are very large. So all these colored bars represent percentage errors with respect to some, uh, so, some quite decent uh, or, uh, target. But phenomenology is captured, the, uh, the details are not. And really what, uh, what one would hope is that we could try and unite all these, uh, all these different approaches. So we want reactivity um, from the materials force fields, accuracy like we have in the gas phase molecules and transferability like we have for the organic force fields. So this gives rise to this idea of using machine learning to achieve this and really to think of potentials or force fields as function interpolators. So here's a, a little cartoon of, of the idea. We have our Schrodinger solver in some approximation. It's going to give us solutions of the lowest eigenvalue of the Schrodinger equation in some approximation at a constant unit cost per configuration. And that gives rise to this potential energy surface, which you'd like to know and be evaluate and evaluate very, very fast. So we're building a surrogate model. And we're going to do that by transforming this space into some description, local descriptors, geometric descriptors of the environments of atoms and then do regression. So supervised learning of the Schrodinger solution. And that's going to be our interpolator, um, which we can query much, much, much faster. So what I'd like to report to you that after so 10 years of trying this by me and lots of other people, some of whom I will mention later on, this generally works. So here's an example of a potential, a force field for carbon that we just released. And what you see here is a, it's some sort of view of all the different kinds of carbon structures that one would be interested in. So it includes diamond, graphite, nanotubes, buckyballs. They're all um, on this diagram somewhere. And we would like to make a potential that works sufficiently well for the particular application for each of, for, for all of this, for anything you can build out of carbon. And just to show you how, uh, from a signal processing perspective, how hard this is, here are two examples of the carbon-carbon dimer. So just two carbon atoms moving uh, uh, next to each other. This is a function as the energy as a function of distance. And in, ter in terms of electron volts, it goes, let's say it goes up to 10 electron volts. So that's um, in terms of temperature, if you actually had a carbon dimer, that would, so one electron volt corresponds to about 12,000 degrees. So this would correspond to about 100,000 degrees um, if this was under equilibrium. But if your potential isn't good in this range, then when you do molecular dynamics, you wouldn't actually reproduce the vibrations uh, of, of these atoms. And on the very other end of, um, of the length energy scale, if you have graphite, graphite is a very soft material. So layers of it come apart and the energy of binding between graphite layers is just uh, 10 to the minus one EV, EV actually is less than that, is like a quarter of that. So what you really have is this range of about a factor of a hundred in the energies that you're trying to describe. And in order to get accuracy, let's say you want 90% accuracy of these curves, you really have a, sort of a, a signal to accuracy ratio of one in a thousand or one in 10,000 that you need to learn. So you're learning accuracy for energy per atom needs to be on the order of one part in 10,000. And that's very, very difficult. Nevertheless, uh, with, a, with a sparse kernel model, uh, I'll explain in a slide later what, which kernel is being used, but 9,000 basis functions, we take 6,000 Oracle evaluations 
which yields us about 400,000 scalars. So that's the data we fit to. Um, we actually achieve this. So here's just a bunch of uh, formation energies for lots and lots of different forms of carbon. And the target is the black um, circle. The model, our model is the red cross. And you can see that, th that we really broadly get this right. Um, the, uh, the light gray cr crosses are the existing models. So the non-machine learned empirical models of all different kinds that people have made before. So this is what, this is the power of machine learning. This is why we're in this business that we can actually make a step change to the accuracy of these models. And the speed up of these models compared to actually solving the Schrodinger equation at the level uh, where, where, we, where we need to is about a, a million or more. The reason I put the more is because in fact, the scaling is different with the number of atoms. So good solutions of the Schrodinger equation scale typically polynomially, say cubically um, with the number of atoms whereas all the machine learning models are linear. So I said we use a kernel model. Of course, uh, there have been similarly performing uh, models with other methods, but I just want to show you how simple these kernel models are. So here's an example. So um, here's the kernel that I'm going to build. Uh, here's an atom I. I'm going to describe its environment within some short range cutoff. This is critical. So we impose some compact support and build up this row, this density of neighbors by just putting some um, convolution kernel on each atom. And it could be a delta function or it could be a Gaussian. And this row is therefore now a permutational invariant, smooth and continuous uh, representation of the neighborhood of the carbon atom or any other atom I care about. And in order to make it rotationally invariant, I'm going to take this uh, density and expand it in spherical harmonics and some radial basis function in G. And these uh, C and LM expansion coefficients can be combined here. Uh, if you sum over M, C, N, L, M, C, N prime L, M gives you a, a, an array P, N, N prime L. It's called a power spectrum. And it turns out that that's rotationally invariant. Not only that, it's a very, very good uh, descriptor to be used for building uh, nonlinear models. So the kernel that we use uh, is sort of inspired by this fact that the dot product of these P vectors is actually equ equivalent formally to the integrated overlap of these densities. So you take two of these densities, you mul multiply them, integrate their overlap, and also integrate all the possible rotations and that gives you something that is exactly p dot p, and we call it the SOAP kernel, smooth overlap of atomic positions, raise it to some small power. And that is the kernel that gives us these exquisitely accurate results uh, for, the, for re regressing the Schrodinger equation. There have been many, many other uh, descriptions that actually ultimately turn out to be equivalent to, to these kernels and descriptors. So atom center symmetry functions of York Baylor and also the any force field FCHL uh, descriptors and BTR descriptors. These are uh, descriptors built over the years turn out to be rather similar in what they capture um, about the environment and the equivalent mathematically to this uh, power spectrum in the complete basis limit if you don't truncate uh, the basis functions. Here's another example for tungsten. This is uh, slightly earlier work. If you wanted to simulate BCC tungsten and you went through the available models from the 80s, 90s, and the noughties, then you get these sorts of accuracies uh, compared to some reference. You know, up to 50% error um, in, uh, so here it says 30% error in this case, uh, in the vacancy formation energy. Once you turn on these kernel models based on the environment, bam, you just nail it. Okay, and again, the requirements of this uh, are not very onerous and the speed is very, very fast compared to the uh, baselines. So here's uh, another comprehensive model for silicon. This is the uh, example I showed earlier of how poor the existing models uh, are doing. And the red line here, the red bars, is the soap-based kernel model that basically has under 10% error across the board without any special fiddling without having to, you know, if you take the MEAM model, you get a, a very good 110 surface energy because you can adjust the parameters to do that, but then other properties um, have turned out to have a very large error. Whereas once you take the kernel model, the errors are good across the board. And so this was about materials, which is my home turf, but of course other people have applied very similar techniques 
to, uh, to molecules. And here's an example, courtesy of, uh, of Anatol von Ilienfeld, who's going to give a talk uh, uh, tomorrow or the day after, where he's benchmarked a whole bunch of machine learning models on what is called the QM9 data set, small organic molecules, equilibrium positions of small organic molecules. And this is, these are learning curves for predicting the energy of the equilibrium state. And uh, he's going to, I'm sure, talk about this in more detail. But I just want to point out that the simple kernel models, again, are state of the art in this and have remained so over a number of years. Here's another uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, this is, again, a kernel model making custom molecular force fields. So this is taking a molecule, taking some samples of it, and building that uh, regression model for the lowest eigenstate of the Schrodinger equation. This is from, uh, from Alex Kachenko's work. He's also going to give a talk later on. And again, these are learning curves. And you can see that it reaches accurate, this convergence, and it reaches accuracies, which are really quite exquisite, very, very good. This 0.3 kcal per mole is, is accuracy that's better than what you need to do a lot of chemistry. And finally, um, here's another model. It's called the NECC model of Oleg Sizaev and Adrian Reutberg and company. Uh, uh, some of our students and postdocs have contributed. This is now a model, not for any given molecule, but for a, a generic, uh, any kind of, kind of molecule. The uh, descriptors are again, two and three body environmental descriptors, slightly different formulation uh, from mine, but um, they just feed it uh, into a three layer feed forward neural network and get really rather good results for what you want in this, uh, in this molecular data set. So the torsion angles, these are rotation angles around the dihedral angle. So here are four atoms and you rotate the structure around this bond. And what you see here is the accuracy with respect to um, some Oracle where the existing models are over here on the right. And you can see these very large errors and in terms of kcal per mole, this is four kcal per mole compared to the 0.3 uh, that I said was very good earlier. So you reach these kind of 0.3 kcal per mole errors and places um, this machine learned force field well into the regime of very expensive solutions of the Schrodinger equation. So that's the, um, the NECC model. Here's a, a finally an example that's not to do with force fields but using the same kind of idea. So you can use, uh, particularly the kernels that we've developed are good for other things. So here's a different kind of problem, a protein drug, bind drug binding problem. We thought this was hard, but actually it turns out to be very, very easy once you use these techniques. So here's a protein and it's going to, uh, it's in the protein data bank. There is some uh, molecule that it binds uh, and we would like to know what other molecules are bound to it. Maybe we can design, this is a natural ligand that binds to this protein in the body, maybe we can design a molecule that also binds to it and use that as a drug molecule. So the task is predict whether any given compound will bind or not based on some limited data. And what you do normally here is you order the predictions from not binding to binding, um, and then you compare with the real binders. You do some experiments, maybe experiments are available already, and you want to compare to the molecules that actually bind, that, that are known to bind. So typically these are um, the results are presented in this receiver operating characteristic curve where um, you go through your, in your order of predictions and in this plot, you move to the right if that's a real binder, if you predict it to be binding and it really is binding and you go up according to the index uh, of your list. And so a perfect prediction would just have all the non-binders first and then go across uh, as your listing of all the molecules that bind. The random prediction would just be a straight line whether you list binders or non-binders would come random. And what happens when we apply the, the environment kernel that I mentioned, uh, that you get curves, you, you get an average over many, many different proteins of this red line here. So the, for each protein, these gray curves is the result and their average um, is the red. And what I want to draw your attention to is that we are using very, very few samples, very, very few known binders to make this um, classification. So you reach sort of 99% accuracy, basically just using 20 or 30 examples of, of binders. Moreover, we can even color which atom contributes uh, to, the, to the kernel because we have a, a kernel that's, that's based on atomic environments. So uh, we've built this website that where you just select which protein you want and it gives you all the binders 
and all the non-binders just in order and shows you which atoms contribute uh, to the binding or not. That's the sort of the warhead, right? That's what the drug companies um, really want to look at. What makes that uh, molecule bind? So it's classification there that to be very easy. Uh, predicting binding affinities, so how well does the molecule bind? That's much, much, much harder. And one of the reasons for that actually is that experimental data is much harder to come by and is extremely noisy um, for, for that problem. So I'd like to finish uh, by just giving an outlook uh, and perhaps uh, advertisement for, uh, for the coming talks. So my, my very provocative statement first is that the short range quantum fitting problem as a scientific problem is solved. And what I mean by that, I'm very happy to argue it uh, now or later, is that we have very good descriptors for local atomic environments. And from that, we can build very good kernels. And either using those kernels or using very shallow feed forward neural network regressors is work extremely well for something like the, um, the lowest eigenvalue of the Schrodinger problem. So uh, the empirical force fields, the old ones, the polynomial fits and these recent ML models actually do have a lot of, uh, uh, they do fit into the same conceptual framework. So something that I'm very much looking forward to um, is to try and understand mathematically uh, the unification of, uh, of all these methods. Um, other than that, of course, you need to make actually working models that, that help scientists uh, to do science on these systems. And that's a numerical engineering problem. Optimizing basis sets, optimizing kernels and neural networks uh, is something that lots of people are now engaged in. Something that we are just beginning, I think, is to continue sort of catching up with 50 years of research in quantum chemistry, uh, and that's to do with, with learning long range interaction. So everything that I talked about is short range, the short range quantum mechanics. But of course, we know there are many, many systems where long range interactions uh, are important. And that's, that's where the compact support, the cutoff of the environment that I mentioned, uh, really isn't good enough, at least for that part of the problem. And uh, so for example, see Michele Ceriotti's talk uh, later on uh, in this workshop to see uh, uh, to, to, to the examples of solutions uh, for that. And something else that I've been thinking more and more about recently is the synergy between these ideas that we've developed for force fields and other more general molecular problems that are being tackled with machine learning. So people are very interested in generative models, uh, sort of enumerating and, 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 um, and generating distributions in the space of molecules and materials. This gives rise to lots of unsupervised learning problems and large scale, very large scale classification problems, um, but also representing and regressing the eigenfunctions, something that I didn't talk about at all because I don't do that myself yet, but how to address not the eigenvalue, but actually the wave functions uh, that, that are the Schrodinger solutions uh, rather than just the eigenvalues and how the ideas that we've learned about the, eigen, um, the eigenvalue problem could be perhaps used to help, uh, help with the eigenfunctions problems. And I know several sessions uh, will address that. So thank you very much for listening and we'll be very happy to have questions. Thank you very much, Gabor. It was a very, very uh, uh, nice talk and with a uh, <clears throat> clear introduction to the field and open problems. So, um, so if somebody has, some, has a question, it's time to either write on the chat or raise a, a hand. Um, so maybe while people are, uh, are thinking about it, it was just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, I'm curious about if in the case of, of carbon, can you mention some uh, some kind of new results that you were able to achieve really in predicting and say structures or something like that? Sure, like yeah, sure, yes, of course. So so that's the, that's the exciting thing. Let me just get out of the presentation mode here. Uh, but uh, what I will do is go back to the, um, Go back and find a slide uh, that is uh, that shows uh, one of those results. So let me uh, just quickly scroll through and do that. Um, the, the exciting thing is that some of these problems are actually now being used uh, for to do precisely that to, to, to actually solve um, to, to actually solve real problems. Um, and that's I, I think that's just beginning, um, and that's really exciting. Let me find uh, one of these, um, and it's to do with. Uh, uh, with making carbon films. So uh, that's uh, a problem. That's a technological, uh, carbon films are, are, are a technological material. I think this is the, 
the right slide. Um, so let me show share this. Um, so, right, so diamond like carbon coating is, is a coating that the industry uses. It's on everywhere. You, you wouldn't even know it, right? It's on the heads of uh, hard drives, um, it's ra on razor blades, and so on. Um, and so we've made a model, uh, the one that I showed, but also earlier. And you can use uh, this model to do something like this. So you can actually simulate the growth of this diamond-like carbon coating. So that sort of simulation takes about, you have an incident ion, about 20 to um, 100 EVs, and you shoot that ion into that um, substrate and needs to, you need to do several thousand steps of MD until that ion finds its, uh, atom finds its right uh, uh, position. And then you come with the next one. So this is a simulation where 10,000 times you have to simulate for 10,000 steps and you slowly gradually build up this structure. And if your model is not right, it's going to be the wrong structure. And that was the case up to now. So we, you, before with the empirical models, you couldn't actually get a structure that had the most basic aspect of this um, film correctly, which is the density of, of diamond-like carbon. So how many of your carbons actually have four bonds uh, and, and look like diamond? And so uh, experimentally, this is, this is about 90% if you optimize the incident ion energy. And only with the machine learned model did we actually get the, that 90% uh, diamond-like carbon structure. And once you do that, you can then actually interrogate this simulation and say, how did that happen? What are the, what are the microscopic mechanisms that give rise to, uh, to the formation of that structure? And, uh, and so there's a couple of papers on that. Uh, quite impressive, really. So there are two questions. Um, uh, Max, do, do you want to? Yeah, maybe I can ask a question directly. So, uh, so, so the model you write down, it went a little fast, but the model you wrote down uh, you know, it looks like uh, a graph neural net. So you basically have a convolution over basically your neighbors in a graph uh, with a convolutional kernel G. Um, and I don't quite understand what's below, but then it looks like you're making things rotationally invariant. That's right. So right away. Yeah, I'm not sure but whether that's make... really the right. Um, yeah, I'm making a density. So, so the problem with graphs is that your sort of um, the graph structure is what's in your mind, right? Who's connected to whom? But really, yeah. this isn't the case for molecule. No, but I guess you could just uh, convolve densities over the graph. That's uh -huh. not a problem, and then you get yeah. densities on each one of the nodes. Or, yeah. Yeah. But then uh, the the question really is about so you're making things invariant at every you know, at, at yeah, right yeah, away, yeah, where you right. could, but you could also make things equivariant and then only at the very end of, yeah. you know, I, if, if you I, think of a neural, you can make it invariant in the yeah, end. So it, I wonder I don't, if it, it, For regressing the lowest eigenvalue, the equivariance has no real benefit because the, the eigenvalue that you want ultimately is invariant. Um, and in fact, what you'd really like to make a fast model is a model of the energy of an atom, not for the whole structure. Right? If you were trying to make an energy, if you think of a molecule, if you want the energy of the entire molecule as your target object, then you're right. Yeah. Yes, you only need it at the end. But for materials models, you really don't want to consider the, the full system as a single entity. You want to break down the total energy of the molecule as a sum of local contributions. I didn't emphasize that very much sort of a, a lot of things to cover, but, but for materials models, that is really essential. So that's why we introduced this compact support. Um, and and the, the thing that we're actually reg regressing is the, val is the energy val contribution of each atom. And that needs to be invariant too, not just the total, okay? And that's the reason I'm making it invariant at this point, right? So you could- Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question by Bert Kappen. Yeah, so I think maybe you partly already answered my question. I'm, I was interested in uh, what you say, said about the accuracy of the uh, corresponding eigenvector. Mm -hmm. and I was, was wondering that in computing the uh, estimate of the eigenvalue, you, yeah. are you not implicitly assuming some model for the eigenvector? But maybe this is 
uh, apparently you're not, or I mean- No, I don't think so. And in fact, in, in a way, by certainly in the model that I've introduced here, by I, I've made an assumption that this eigenvalue is a sum of separable atom-centered parts. And clearly that's not a, a priori, that's not a property of the Schrodinger equation, right? I mean, why, why, why would that be true? The eigenfunctions, in fact, are delocalized. So if I change, if I add a new atom to my system, imagine, think about that 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 film that I've grown. I I add another atom, all the eigenvectors are going to change. But the eigenvalue has I, I've made an additivity assumption, and that's for many many materials. That's a rather good one. So I've broken that. Now, of course, you can trace. Uh, you can ask how good an assumption this is, and you can trace that back to local formulations of the uh, Schrodinger equation to do the density matrices and then the locality of those density matrices. But I think that people have found quite difficult to, to build global solutions out of those local pieces, let's put it that way. So maybe I could predict uh, the local part of a density matrix and then certainly people have tried to do that. But if you try to then assemble a global density matrix for the whole system, you would find that the errors that you're making in idempotency or global properties are actually quite large. Whereas the error that you're making on the energy is per atom and actually that's well controlled. So are you saying that part of the success of your accuracy is because you're treating this, this cutoff problem, this, this local range problem, is that, is that a fair? I think, I, I think that's fair. I think that's, that, that when I measure the accuracy in a material system, it's the energy per atom. And as I, and in fact, I make, you know, I make a random, I make a small random error on the scale of a, a, a hundredth of room temperature, which is very small if I'm studying a local process, the total energy of a big system, if I add all of these up for millions of atoms, it's going to diverge like square root n. Yeah. Right. So, so the global uh, and but but I think a lot of modelers would argue that that actually the total energy of millions of atoms in very very many problems is not actually very interesting. It's really the local uh, transformations and the local parts of these uh, of of this potential surface that are actually. Yeah driving the science so um sorry for so we, we, st we still have one question and then we i think we, we need to move forward so uh florian would you like to yeah i was just wondering much of this is trained against numerical data that is obtained from expensive simulations so That's i right. wonder whether people use active learning to select the next best training yeah, samples so that would give you the right. most there so there's a huge activity in that um i think uh, partly it's very interesting, even if you ultimately didn't want to use active learning, knowing, having a method that can prune a data set using the active learning ideas is, is, is probably a very good one. Um, there are a lot of setups where your product is one of these models and you want to do it, use it in a simulation in which you are utterly prohibited from getting more data just due to system size. I mentioned the scaling. So all these models are linear scaling in the number of atoms. Uh, but if, so if I then, go, and I use data that's very, that's captured on a very small number of atoms. So hundred atoms in my input data configurations, but then I go to simulate 10,000 atoms. Even if I think that I now need more data, I can't have it from that simulation because that 10,000 atoms cubic scaling, my Oracle would cost me a million times what a, a data point used to cost when I was training the model. So actually, um, I haven't paid a lot of attention to active learning in my own work because of that, because, because I know that when these models are being used, actually you can't, um, you can't query your Oracle anymore. But, but there is a lot of body of work that, 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 that is important. Okay, so thank you very much again. Thank you very much.